There's a lot of shonen manga out there, all kinds of different series, so varied that there's probably something there that will tickle your fancy. But amongst all the competition, a few series have risen to the top as all-time greats. Dragon Ball, Naruto, One Piece, these are all great series that have become synonymous with shonen itself. Series like these end up booming in popularity, resulting in anime adaptations, video games, action figures, trading cards, t-shirts, fast food cross-promotions, the works. And because of the huge marketing push, these series are household names known the world over. Which brings us to today's topic, a little series called Kotekyo Hitman Reborn. If you've never heard of it, I wouldn't blame you. It's a series that's sort of fallen by the wayside in modern conversation. But in its heyday, Reborn had it all. An anime, over 20 video games, a trading card game, several light novels, and all manner of merchandise. So, why? Why was this series the one that time forgot? What made it so big in the first place? And what makes it one of my personal favorite shounen of all time? Today, I'll be exploring those questions and attempt to answer what makes Kotekyo Hitman Reborn special. I was introduced to Reborn like I'm sure many people were. Jump Ultimate Stars. If you've never heard of it, it's a Smash Bros. style platform fighter for the DS, where the entire roster consists of Shonen Jump characters. And it's pretty good, too. Better than Jump Force, at least. And amongst all your Gokus and Jojos, there's this kid, named Suna. He's a bit weird, most of his attacks seem almost unintentional on his part, and he strips down to his underwear for some of them. I wasn't entirely sure what that was about, but he was fun to play, so I put him on my main team. And then I saw his final super move, and... Alright, now you've got me curious. How does this kid go from being a weird goofball whose basic combo involves him tripping over his own feet to having this epic beatdown of a super? So I decided to actually check out the anime for myself. Kotekyo Hitman Reborn, or just Reborn, began being published in Weekly Shonen Jump in May of 2004, and would finish its run in November of 2012. The series stars Suniyoshi Suwada, or just Suna, a 14-year-old boy who sucks at... basically everything. He's not athletic, he gets bad grades, he has no real friends, and he's scared of everything from bullies to small dogs. Not exactly ideal protagonist material, until one day he's visited by the titular Hitman, Reborn. Who is a baby? And it's his mission to whip Suna into shape to become the next boss of the Vongola family, the most powerful mafia family in the world. Not exactly in line with standard battle shonen premises, but that's partially because Reborn didn't start out as a battle manga at all. If you've ever heard someone recommend Reborn, they've probably included the addendum that the series has a notoriously slow start. Hell, Reborn is basically the poster child for the It Gets Better X Amount of Chapters In manga. Reborn's author, Akira Amano, originally wrote it as a comedy series, something very much noticeable in the early parts of the manga. Rather than the high-intensity battles that the series would later be known for, Reborn's early chapters are more slice-of-life fare, with a focus on loud, absurd, Japanese-style humor. And, well, I'll just be honest, most of it isn't that funny. A lot of the same kinds of gags are used over and over, and it gets old kind of fast. That's not to say these chapters don't have their moments, for instance, I personally always get a kick out of Chapter 19, where the gang finds a dead body in Suna's room. Don't ask. But I know that these first chapters can be a turnoff for a lot of people. And it wouldn't be that big of a deal if this comedic part didn't go on for so long. In all, Reborn consists of 409 chapters, 61 of which it spends as a gag manga. That's around 15% of the entire story and 8 whole manga volumes. Hell, the anime went so far as to split up the comedy chapters, intercutting them with the more action-focused arcs, in addition to altering or straight-up removing certain chapters that were unimportant to the overarching plot. Even then, the parts that are left are half spent on character introductions and half spent on gag shenanigans, so there's still going to be some slice-of-life bits to wade through if you're watching the anime. It's really a situation of how you want to tear off the mediocrity band-aid, all in one go or a bit at a time. 
If anything, I'd almost recommend starting at chapter 62 when the action begins, then going back to read the first set of chapters after completing the series. It's fun seeing these characters that you know from an intense battle shounen being placed in comparatively more subdued scenarios. Which brings me to one of Reborn's greatest strengths, its characters. While there are plenty of them introduced, and not all of them hit the mark, <coughs> the ones that stick around prove to be incredibly memorable and likable. This is one reason why I don't fully recommend skipping the so-called daily life arc on your first read, because the arc does do a great job establishing the characters who go on to become soon as friends and loyal members of his new mafia family. First and foremost is the title character, Reborn. While he can be irritating at times, the surprising amount of wisdom that he holds makes him a good mentor figure. Watching his bond with Suna grow to the point where they almost feel like brothers more than master and pupil is really enjoyable, as is keeping track of all the hints to his true identity given throughout the story. Part of the fun of the series comes from unraveling the mystery behind Reborn, and how he's so strong despite barely reaching the other character's kneecaps. Hayato Gokudera starts out as a Mafia member who intends to test Suna to determine if he is worthy of becoming the new boss, but after seeing Suna in action decides to follow him religiously with the aim of becoming Suna's right-hand man. His intelligence and hot-headedness are only trumped by his devotion to the family, willing to put himself in harm's way on multiple occasions in order to protect Suna. Takeshi Yamamoto is the group's baseball-loving himbo turned deadly swordsman himbo. Despite his happy-go-lucky nature, he's a loyal and caring friend, and demonstrates numerous times the sacrifices he's willing to make for others, even if he does lose a fight to a wall at one point. Kyoko Sasagawa is a girl that Tsuna has a massive crush on, and while she mostly serves the role of being the token girl character, her kind nature helps to ground Tsuna on a few occasions. In particular, their conversation in Chapter 237 is one of my favorite character moments in the series. On the other hand, Kyoko's brother Ryohei is a boxer who always likes to live life to the extreme, and while he does become a bit of a jobber later on, the few fights he does get are some of the best that Reborn has to offer. Lambo is dumb, and annoying, and I hate him. But his fights with Levi and Large are two of my favorites, so he gets a pass. Haru Miura is a girl who develops a crush on Tsuna after he saves her from drowning in a river. Haru's a bit of a tomboy in contrast with Kyoko's more girly demeanor, and her more assertive nature and penchant for rather strange costumes help add some zaniness to the roster. Kyoya Hibari is the no-nonsense leader of the school disciplinary committee, which is apparently a thing in Japan, and is a clear fan favorite. Honestly, it's pretty easy to see why. His entire character is that he hates crowds and being around other people, and in a shonen series with plenty of typical power of friendship moments, it's a funny juxtaposition. Combined with the fact that Hibari's ludicrously strong compared to everyone else, and his signature catchphrase, Kami Kuros. Kami Kuros. Kami Kuros. Kami Kuros. Just, yeah, he's so cool. And that's just going over some of the more important characters. I haven't even talked about Gokudera's sister, Bianchi, the infant martial artist Epin, Reborn's former student Dino, or the numerous other great characters introduced in later arcs, but this video would probably be about twice as long if I did that. The point here is that all of these characters serve the story and are unique in their own ways. What's especially great is that all of them still feel like regular teenagers. Mixed in with all the action, there's plenty of moments of the characters just hanging out, going to festivals, or working on homework together. It really helps you by the close-knit friendship between all of them, which serves the themes of the story even more. Arguably, the best example of this comes in the form of the main character, Suna. From the start of the series to basically the end, Suna wants almost nothing to do with any Mafia business. He tries his best to just live a normal teenage life, actively avoiding conflict if he can. Compare this to other shonen protagonists from the time, like Naruto and Luffy, both of whom have set end goals that they are determined to reach, and are willing to actively fight tooth and nail to do so. Even a protagonist like Ichigo, a comparatively reactionary character, still has some sense of agency about him, and is more than willing to rough up some bad guys. In contrast, Tsuna's more of a pacifist, preferring not to resort to violence if possible. Probably the best comparison here is Gohan from Dragon Ball Z. Like Tsuna, he's terrified by the idea of fighting at first, and continues to detest it until he fully accepts that he has to fight in order to protect the people that he cares about. A moment that shows this really well is this little flashback in Chapter 182. The team is discussing their plans for an upcoming attack on an enemy base, which will be guarded by incredibly strong unmanned combat robots. When asked why he's so happy about this, Suna responds, 
because if there's nobody inside, I don't have to worry about killing someone when I destroy it, right? He's more concerned with not killing his enemies than his own safety, and that's part of what makes him such a great main character. Reborn is, at its core, soon as coming-of-age story. In any other manga, one of the many, many more combat-ready side characters could easily fill the role of the protagonist. But Reborn chooses to follow the journey of this initially meek boy as he learns to be more assertive and have more confidence in himself, without losing the core of his character, his empathy. And it's this empathy that allows Suna's other character trait to really shine, his ability to bring people together. Most shonen heroes have that degree of charisma that makes them the bona fide leader of their little group, but what sets Reborn apart is how personal the connections between the characters are. Because of how close-knit the main cast is, each character has a unique relationship with almost every other individual character. While other series may spread themselves thin in this regard, you can basically take any two members of Reborn's main cast and find some instance where they've interacted, even if it's indirectly. And Suna is the main thing that ties a lot of these people together. His personality makes him someone that the others naturally want to follow and this loyalty is put to the test time and time again over the course of the story, starting with the series' first big step forward, the Kokuyo arc. Chapter 62 begins with a massive tonal change from the previous chapters. We learn that students from Suna's school are being attacked and hospitalized by students from a different school, Kokuyo Junior High. After Hibari goes to confront their boss and doesn't come back, and Gokudera gets seriously injured fighting one of them, the stakes are raised, and Reborn asserts that the culprits are a group of incredibly dangerous convicts who have escaped from a mafia prison in Italy. While Soon is reluctant to do anything personally, after seeing how much danger his friends are in, he steals himself and prepares to confront the convicts. Suna and Co. soon arrive at an abandoned amusement park that is serving as the convict's base. We get a few smaller battles here to help flush out some of the supporting cast. Yamamoto fights Beast Boy, Bianchi fights this clarinet girl, there's this creepy old guy with a pain fetish, and then the big boss, this guy with a massive iron ball that proceeds to make short work of everyone until Suna steps up to the plate. After a pretty grueling fight, Iron Ball Guy, his name's Lancia by the way, reveals that he's not actually the boss. He was merely being controlled and tormented by the real boss, someone named Mukuro Rokudo. But before Lancia can tell Suna about Mukuro's plan, he's put out of commission by one of Mukuro's other goons. With his forces dwindled, Suna goes in to confront Mukuro, leading us to the first major fight of the series. If there's one thing that should have been made pretty clear from the video thus far, it's that Reborn does a great job of establishing its characters, and as the first major antagonist of the series, Mukuro is no exception to that rule. He immediately shows off an impressive range of abilities, from superhuman speed, to animal summoning, to creating massive illusions. But it's only after a few of Suna's allies show up and give Mukuro a good clobbering that he reveals his most impressive ability, body possession. Not only can Mukuro take complete control of a person, he can control multiple people at once, forcing Suna into a life and death battle against his own friends. Mukuro's cold nature is put on full display as he is willing to even possess the bodies of his own comrades and use them to their literal breaking point. Being the good boy he is, Suna can't stand for this, and despite his fear, despite his injuries, resolves to defeat Mukuro. And that's when this happens. This, this is the point where Reborn becomes a different series. Gone is the strange comedy manga with scattered bits of action, and in its place is a bona fide battle shonen. Soon as power up here is indicative of more than just a tonal change, however. It's a visual demonstration of his development even this early on. His transformation from a meek boy running for his life to a calm, collected, stone-cold badass is striking, and watching him effortlessly see through all of Mukro's attacks and painlessly knock out his friends is cathartic, especially for those who were getting a bit sick of Suna's previous shtick. After an honestly really well-animated battle, Suna is victorious, but still chooses to show Mukro mercy despite all of the horrible things he's done. And as soon as Power Up fades away, we see his face change back to a more familiar, softer expression, showing that, despite everything, he's still Suna. Oh yeah, now would probably be a good time to talk about that Power Up. 
I love me a good shonen power system. It's part of what makes series like Hunter x Hunter and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure stick out so much. Both of them have power systems that stray away from tradition, allowing characters to triumph with foresight and ingenuity rather than sheer strength, and I personally believe they're both better off for it. And while I don't think Reborn's power system is as well constructed as either of theirs, it still has enough nuances within it to set the series apart. Reborn's power system initially consists of the Dying Will Bullet, a special bullet that gives whoever is shot with it superhuman power and the single-minded goal to fix whatever they regretted most when they got shot. This can be anything from saving someone's life to asking out a girl. Also, the bullet has the teeny tiny side effect of causing the clothes of the recipient to burst off, leaving them only in their underwear. As you can imagine, this was initially used for a large portion of the humor early on. Fortunately, once the series switches over to a battle mode, Suna's Dying Will mode is replaced with the upgraded Hyper Dying Will mode. This is the aforementioned Super Badass mode that he gets during the fight with Mukuro. This is also our first look at the Dying Will Flame. While at first it's literally just Suna shooting fire out of his hands, by the time the story gets to the future arc, the system has been expanded tremendously. See, there are actually seven different types of Dying Will Flames. Okay, technically there's like 15, but those other 8 are special cases, so we don't need to talk about them right now. Anyway, the 7 main types of flames are each named after different aspects of weather, and each has slightly different properties. For example, green lightning flames have a hardening factor that allows them to increase the toughness of objects for more durability. Purple cloud flames have a propagation factor, letting them expand and multiply objects. The way that these different attributes interact with each other and alter the fighting styles of the characters adds an element of strategy to the combat, allowing characters to win certain bouts through smart application of their abilities, rather than just brute force. This is then added onto with the introduction of rings and boxes. Rings allow a flame user to better channel their flames, and more importantly, open boxes, which can contain traps, weapons that can be imbued with flames, or animals made of flames, that provide assistance in battle. However, boxes can only be opened by a compatible flame type. For instance, a storm box can only be opened with storm flames. The exception to this is sky flames, which can open any kind of box, and... Alright, I know that this is a lot of info I'm dumping here, but the most important thing to take away from this is that dying wolf flames have a variety of functions and applications, but they're still centralized enough that none of the characters' powers feel too out of place. It still allows for the cast to use a wide range of weapons and fighting styles, from tonfa to dynamite to transforming into a dinosaur. But my favorite part about Dying Will Flames as a power system is how, as the name implies, the strength of a character's flames is directly based on that character's willpower. The stronger someone's drive to win or resolve to protect something is, the stronger the flame will be. This turns classic tropes like the power of friendship or a simple rage boost into actual tangible power-ups. This also ties directly into the story's themes of helping Suna build confidence in himself, as it's that confidence that, quite literally, makes him stronger. This power system helps to fuel some truly fantastic fight scenes, which offer a good mix of solid fight choreography and emotional character moments. I've already talked about the fight against Mukuro, but soon as battles with Reborn's other major villains are just as well done, if not even better. This is one area where the anime obviously has an advantage over the manga, as the medium of animation allows the battles with the likes of Zanzis, Genkishi, and Byakuran to feel all the more explosive. One other advantage that the anime holds is that the manga doesn't have these kickin' tunes, dude! I rarely pay attention to background music in anime save for one or two straight pieces, but damn it, Katekyo Hitman Reborn has my favorite anime OST of all time. The soundtrack knows when to be silly, when to be somber, and when to be intense, and it all hits. It helps accentuate many of the series' more dramatic moments, and it's even a good listen on its own. I listen to it all the time when I'm working on projects, and hell, I'm probably listening to it as I edit this very video. Some of my favorite songs include Holy War, Standing Friends, Hurricane Bomb, Ken and Chikusa, Leader of the Disciplinary Committee, Zanzis, Assembly, Xburner, To the Future, Cooperation, Extremely Sunny, and of course, Soon Awakens. I've put a link to a video with the full soundtrack in the description, I suggest you give it a listen sometime. For all the good that I've said about the anime, I'm still of the opinion that the manga is the better way to experience Reborn. For one thing, the final two arcs of the series never received an anime adaptation, so if you want the full story, you'd have to read those parts anyway. Even for the arcs that were animated, I think that the pacing in the manga is a lot better. 
Once you get past the daily life arc, things move at a pretty brisk pace. As I mentioned at the start of the video, the anime does break up the daily life segments and scatters them between the other arcs, which does allow the story to reach the initial action quicker, but at the cost of bogging down the rest of it. And that's in addition to the two anime-only filler arcs thrown into the middle of the already pretty long future arc. While they do offer some good character moments, and even provide some foreshadowing for the next arc of the manga, they're both pretty pointless in the grand scheme of things, although they're far from the worst filler, and I would recommend fans give them a watch at least once. In fairness, the manga has its fair share of what I would consider filler that's absent from the anime, but it's not nearly as prevalent. It's just disappointing that anime onlys never get to see Koala Ryohei. But for my money, the biggest advantage to reading the manga is the art. Reborn was written and illustrated by Akira Amano, a manga artist whose other works include the Jump Plus series Eld Live, uh, I Live? Eld Live, as well as the currently running Ron Kamanohashi Deranged Detective. Although, if you recognize her style, it's probably from the Psychopath series, of which she was the main character designer. And if it's one thing I will immediately give Reborn props for, it is said art. Part of the fun of reading a long-running series like this is seeing the artist's style improve and evolve over the course of its run. That's part of the reason as to why series like Bleach or Shield 21 are so enjoyable to read. And while I don't think she's on the same artistic level as Kubo or Murata, Amano's art, especially near the end of Reborn, is impeccable, rendering characters with incredible detail while still keeping everything readable. I have instant respect for any artist who can draw fabric well, and damn does Amano draw some good fabric. She also has a knack for character design, with her designs ranging from effective simplicity to humorous exaggeration, with none of it feeling out of place in Reborn's world. My mark of good character design is when you can make a character look good in a suit, and since almost every character in the series wears a suit at some point, that's high marks all around. Now with all the praise I've thrown around, I'm sure you're wondering, gee, this sounds great, so why have I never heard of it before? The answer to that question is complicated, and one that's not really set in stone, so here's what I've been able to infer. Despite how things may seem, Reborn is still pretty popular in Japan. Just this past spring of 2021, the series had a crossover merchandise series with Sanrio, and earlier in March, the mobile game Jamputi Heroes had a huge event based on Reborn's Inheritance Ceremony arc. Why is this game not available in English? It looks so cool! There's even a still ongoing series of Reborn stage plays. These are so cursed. Why? Why do these exist? These are not things that happen to some niche anime with a small fanbase. Reborn just never hit mainstream popularity in the West like it did in Japan. Very little of the series was ever officially localized. None of the video games were, with the closest being Suna appearing as a playable character in J-Star's Victory Versus, and the anime never received an English dub. The manga was partially localized by Viz Media, but they only localized up through Volume 16, less than halfway through the full run. The anime did start being simulcast on Crunchyroll in 2009, back when that site was in its infancy, and this actually did help fuel the flames of a small western fandom. I did some digging for this video and found some pretty good old fan art, as well as a lot of ancient memes. The fandom also had this weird thing where they would refer to characters by these number shorthands, there's even an entire page on the wiki that just lists them. So people would post lists of their favorite ships and it just looked like some sort of Cold War era secret code. But after the anime ended, followed by the manga just two years later, the fandom just kind of died out as people moved on to other series that were starting to crop up at the time. So why did Reborn not get the big push that other shonen series got? Well, I feel like a lot of it has to do with that first bunch of chapters. Viz stopped localizing the manga after 16 volumes, likely due to low sales, and if you'll recall from much earlier, half of those were entirely made up of comedy chapters. And given that Reborn was released right in the heyday of the big three, and being a manga with a very weird style of humor, it wasn't something that was likely going to cut it in the West. The anime had its own problems, the series never received an official dub, likely due to studios seeing it as pretty risky to dub a weird comedy series where the main character gets shot in the head in every episode. 
Because of this, the series was never licensed for release outside of Japan, so Funimation decided to copyright strike any English fan sub they could find, making it that much harder for Western fans to get into the series. This did become less of an issue once Crunchyroll licensed the series, but they started right smack in the middle of it, so curious viewers would have had to play catch up and watch the 100 or so episodes that they missed out on in order to find out what was going on. And it's really unfortunate, because if the length of this video was any indication, I love Kotekyo Hitman Reborn. It's one of my all-time favorites. It's not perfect, but it's a series with a lot of heart, lovable characters, and some of the most solid shonen storytelling I've seen. If this video has convinced you, I highly recommend you go check the series out, manga or anime. Reborn deserves much more than being left in the shonen jump backlog, and with all the mid-2000s anime revivals happening, who knows? Maybe one day it'll get a chance to shine in the spotlight once again. Hey, thanks for watching. This is my first time trying something like this, so feel free to leave a comment telling me what you thought. And if you want to like or subscribe, that would really mean a lot. Thanks again, and I'll see you all next time. Take care.